Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. My guest today is Christopher Bale. He is a professor of sociology, public policy, and data science at Duke University, where he directs the Polarization Lab, which brings together scholars from the social sciences, statistics, and computer science to study how we might bridge America's partisan divide. Chris is also the author of a new book called Breaking the Social Media Prism, which examines how our behavior online is driving our divisions and explores how we might remake social media platforms to bring out the best in us rather than the worst. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yes, it's good to have you. So in the book, you argue that, you know, while we often use social media as a mirror uh, to decipher our place in society, it also functions like a prism. It distorts our identities. It empowers certain people over others. And it often renders moderates invisible when compared with the loudest voices on the fringe. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of social media as a prism? Uh, how can that help us understand how it's driving divisions and how we might overcome them? Sure. Well, one of the things I'm sure you discuss on this podcast all the time is the depth of misperceptions between uh, Republicans and Democrats, right? We all have heard some of these figures. You know, we tend to exaggerate how extreme the other side is. Um, you know, we tend to misunderstand what their views on different policies are. And this misperception gap uh, or perception gap is, you know, really easy to correct. Once we correct it, uh, people tend to come together, research shows. So, you know, the really interesting question, I think, is to what extent is social media contributing to the perception gap between Republicans and Democrats? And from my research, I think the answer is that it's, it's pushing the perception gap into hyperdrive. You know, one thing that we all do as human beings, one thing that makes us kind of uniquely human, is that we, we're kind of hardwired to read our social environments. You know, we look around ourselves and in other people for evidence of kind of, you know, what types of identities are working for us. You know, we all want to fit in. We all want some kind of social status. And so, you know, since we were, you know, um, homo sapiens, you know, hunting and gathering, we've been kind of um, honing this instinct and this ability to cultivate identities that give us status. So, you know, one of the interesting things about social media is, well, how does it affect that human tendency to care so much about what other people think about us? And I think it does kind of affect things in two principal ways. The first way is that we have more flexibility to experiment with different kinds of identities than we've ever had before. So, you know, on social media, I can be, uh, you know, you can hear about every single detail in my life down to like what I had for breakfast, or I could be a completely different person, right? I can, on, on, online, I can be virtually anyone. And second, I have these powerful new tools, like counts, follower counts, and so on, that help me more efficiently monitor what other people think of me. And so, you know, on the one hand, it's more efficient, but it's not really more accurate. And that's where that prism idea comes in. So when we think about social media and the motivations of people using social media, you know, a lot of people think, well, we're going out there to kind of gain information or maybe expose ourselves to new views. But really what I think we're doing is kind of testing out our identities and cultivating those that get good reactions from other people. And this, as you said, has created a perverse incentive structure where extremists have every incentive to continue saying more radical things because they get feedback that validates those views. And the problem with that is that this creates the illusion that extremists are in fact moderates. And so I titled this book, Breaking the Social Media Prism, because I think we have to develop ways to um, overcome the perception gap on social media that results from this all too human behavior. You know, We're not gonna content moderate our way out of this. The platforms aren't gonna save us. Ultimately, it's up to us to close the perception gap and change the way we behave on social media. And you mentioned the likes and the follows and the data that we have that 
sort of lets us know how we're doing and you know how we're, our our identity is performing with various audiences. How does the 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 algorithms sort of reinforce that prism and how might they function differently to make it easier for us to transcend it? Yeah, great question. You know, in the polarization lab here at Duke, you know, what we're often up to is trying to use the tools of data science to, as you said, you know, um, try to create better, more positive incentives uh, for, for, for people to come together instead of engage in the kind of partisan warfare that we've all seen too often on social media. So, I mean, you know, yeah, a key, a key issue is algorithms. And I think a lot of people would love to believe, and I myself, even uh, several years ago, before I began the research for this book, would have liked to believe that most of the responsibility for our current predicament lies on the, you know, uh, on, on Facebook or, or Twitter or, or other platforms that are profiting from the way we, um, you know, from, from hate and, 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 and boosting hateful language. And certainly, especially in recent weeks, as we've seen some of the reporting coming out of the Wall Street Journal about the Facebook files, it does seem that some of the you know, vitriol we see comes from the way that algorithms boost um, material, posts and messages, according to how much they get engagement. And of course, you know, we tend to only engage with our side. Um, and when we do that, that tends to um, kind of have a preaching to the choir effect and um, you know, we see kind of more and more kind of partisan cheerleading. And so the incentives are kind of all wrong. The incentives are pushing people to extremes. How much the algorithm itself is responsible for that, though, is kind of um, really still not yet well known. The most recent evidence that's looked at things like YouTube, a little bit at other platforms, um, suggests that algorithms probably aren't principally responsible and that it's actually probably human core human motivations to seek belonging um, that are driving this. So, you know, I'd love to tell you, hey, we can just go tell Facebook, you know, change your algorithm and, 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 and you know, this way or that, and, and we're going we're gonna to hack this problem. But I think the problem runs a lot deeper than that. Interesting. Yeah, because I think a lot of people look at this from a design perspective. You know, if only we could make certain changes to the designs of the platforms, then we could sort of fundamentally change behavior. And it seems like you're saying that maybe those changes could help at the margins, but we really need to think more fundamentally about how we can shift cultural and political and social incentives that will then be expressed by our behavior on the platforms? Well, look, I think we need solutions from the top down and the bottom up. So there are things that I think platforms could do. For example, instead of optimizing and boosting messages that appeal to kind of, you know, lots of people on one side, why not boost messages that appeal to people on both sides? Um, mm. You know, and that would, in a way, kind of optimize for democracy. Now, we've tried to put forth this type of model in some of the technology that we've created in the polarization lab. For example, if your listeners and viewers go to polarizationlab.com, they'll find our bipartisanship leaderboard, which is a tool that we built that constantly tracks politicians, journalists, uh, media organizations, advocacy groups like Braver Angels, and counts the, the frequency with which both Republicans and Democrats like their posts. Um, then we've also built bots that you can follow that retweet those messages to kind of try to, exp to, try to change the algorithm for yourself um, well, we're still waiting for, for platforms to, to come up with solutions. So, uh, but, you know, platforms could implement this solution tomorrow. Um, and I think it would have a huge effect. So I don't want to leave your, your listeners or viewers with the impression that, you know, um, there's no blame to go on social media platforms. I just worry about the scenario where we think that, you know, government regulation is going to fix this or more content moderation is going to fix this. And I think that you know, we were deeply polarized before social media came along. We're deeply polarized now, probably even a little more polarized, um, but we're going to continue to be polarized no matter how much content moderation government regulators, um, you know, uh, uh, demand from our platforms. That tool sounds really interesting. I'm curious, how does it determine which users are Democrats and Republicans when it's sort of sifting through the audience that's responding to a politician or a journalist's tweets? 
Sure. We, we use some, some fairly sophisticated techniques for machine learning. In a nutshell, the way it works is we go out and find all elected officials on Twitter. So every Congress, every member of Congress, every senator, every elected official, every, uh, every presidential candidate. Then we go and look at the people who they follow. We scrape the names of the people who they follow. And we find all the people who are followed by at least 10 elected officials. And that, that creates this massive network of what you might call opinion leaders. So it's, you know, it's not only going to include like Mitt Romney and, and, you know, Elizabeth Warren, but it's also going to include Planned Parenthood and, and um, you know, the Heritage Fund. Then what we do is we look for patterns in where, you, you know, kind of which elected officials follow which organization. And from that, we infer our measure of, of ideology. So, you know, if you are principally followed by Republican politicians, then we classify you as, as more Republican leaning. And if you are principally followed by um, liberal pol liberals, we, we, we do the opposite. But actually, you know, the, 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 the leaderboard is powered by real people. So we've put out surveys of, over multiple uh, points in time. And what we do is we kind of, we know what these people's actual political views are because we've given them lots and lots of surveys. But then we can also link that survey data to their social media behavior with their permission, of course. And what we discover is we can look for patterns where the Republicans are liking a Democrat's tweets or, or vice versa. And that's how the leaderboard gets set up. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And folks can find that on the Polarization Labs website, right? That's right. PolarizationLab.com. Cool. One of the other things that I liked about the book was how it kind of takes on common myths that exist about these topics, whether it's, you know, echo chambers or algorithms or, or misinformation. Can you talk a little about what are some of these existing narratives that some folks might take as conventional wisdom, but that your research actually found to be lacking or insufficient in certain ways? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many stories out there about how social media polarizes us. I think, you know, we already talked a little bit about algorithms. The evidence there is actually less, much less strong than, than you'd think. The other two that, I, that you also mentioned are kind of echo chambers and misinformation. So let's, let's maybe take on those two. First, the idea of the echo chamber. I mean, it's so compelling. You know, anybody who was watching, you know, America from 2016 to 2020 and saw some kind of, you know, pretty shocking developments. If you're on the left, for example, maybe you were surprised by the election of Trump and, you know, oh, surely this is because you only follow other Democrats online. And, you know, uh, this is why you didn't see the, the enthusiasm that Trump was generating on, on the right. Right. So, you know, I had the same exact view. And in 2017, I led a really large study where we paid about 1200 Republicans and Democrats who use Twitter to follow uh, an automated account that they were told would tweet 24 messages a day. We didn't tell them what it was gonna tweet. It turned out that these bots were tweeting messages from the other side. So in a sense, we were conducting a real world experiment where we asked people um, to step outside their echo chamber. Now, what we wanted to see, of course, is if you asked Republicans to follow Democrats, that they might move a little bit more to the center and vice versa, Democrats might become a little more, um, more centrist as well. Instead, what we found is that nobody became more moderate. And in fact, most people seem to be becoming more partisan. So when Republicans followed Democrats, they became substantially more conservative. And when uh, Democrats followed uh, Republicans, they became a little bit more liberal. And so, of course, this throws into question, you know, the prevailing narrative about echo chambers. You know, um, if we're just waiting for Twitter or Facebook to flip a switch and start exposing us to more different kinds of people, it might actually have counterintuitive effects. Now, we need more research. There's been a few follow-up studies that have, have found similar effects. But the other big myth about the echo chamber is that there really aren't that many people in echo chambers. I know that sounds crazy because we hear this all the time, right? We're all st stuck in filter bubbles and echo chambers. But a recent study that not only looked at the US, but also Germany and Britain concluded that probably only about 3.5% of people are in political echo chambers, meaning that they only get information from one side. Another study that looked at Twitter a few years ago came up with a slightly larger figure, maybe six to 10%, but it's hardly the majority that I think most people would think are stuck in an echo chamber. Now, the reason for that 
uh, is that most people simply aren't paying attention to politics online at all and aren't following political accounts. So really what we're seeing is echo chamber phenomenon among the small group of politically active people in the US. So again, if we're looking to say, you know, like, well, let's break the echo chamber, fix the problem. Well, most people aren't in an echo chamber to begin with and taking them out of the echo chamber might actually make it worse. So there's the echo chamber. You know, the other common myth that, that you know, you mentioned was misinformation. And, you know, surely in the age of COVID, you know, we, we, we worry about misinformation all over the place, I think on both sides. Um, but one thing that a lot of people don't know is that the scale of exposure to misinformation is probably also pretty low. Um, some of the early studies that have looked at, say, the 2016 election and the uh, Russia-linked Internet Research Agency's campaign to try to divide Americans. And, you know, they, when, when we look at the, the data, it seems like very small amounts of, of Twitter users, for example, were, were actually exposed to this information, probably less than 2%, and even fewer remembered seeing the information. Um, but simply, you know, you, you could still say, okay, well, a little bit of information, misinformation could do a lot of damage. The problem, though, is when we measure the impact of misinformation, we tend to look at metrics like comments or shares or engagement, right? And, and a lot of time that engagement can be saying, hey, this is misinformation, let's stop sharing it, right? So what you'd really like to look at, I think, is whether the misinformation is actually changing people's minds, whether it's actually dividing us. And we had a unique opportunity to do that because we had this survey data linked to Twitter data, and we could actually look at who was interacting with the bots and see whether those people developed more polarizing views. And again, surprisingly, we discovered that the people who interacted with the bots didn't seem to become more polarized and that the majority of the people interacting with the bots were this small population of people who were deep inside echo chambers and have unusually strong views. In other words, people who couldn't become any more polarized. So again, if we're thinking, you know, okay, Facebook, Google, Twitter, you just gotta do a better job of, of you know, rooting out bad actors. You gotta take us out of our echo chambers. You know, we hear these narratives all over the place from Capitol Hill to, to Netflix documentaries to, 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 to really all corners of the public sphere. But if you ask social scientists like me, and it's not just me, by the way, now, I mean, it's an emerging consensus that these common explanations really don't seem to take us very far. And when you were assessing the sources of misinformation over the past five years, I know you mentioned Russian bots and the relatively slim influence that that they had. But what about something like, you know, President Trump's Twitter account, which obviously is has huge influence. I think a lot of folks argued that a significant portion of his tweets could be considered misinformation. So how do you take that into account when misinformation is actually coming from official sources and really shaping the narrative? Now, that's a different matter altogether. I think you're right. And the other thing I should say is, you know, the research is just starting to come out in, in the kind of post-COVID era, too. So, you know, th things could change. I mean, these are all, you know, this is a young kind of uh, a field. You know, we've only been doing this kind of research for less than 10 years. So it may well change. Um, you know, and I do think that, um, you know, there, there is, of course, a general concern about, uh, you know, uh, whether uh, platforms can make reasonable decisions about whether to flag that kind of information, you know. I mean, the thing that's most telling to me, let's, let's, let's take Trump as an example, because I think you're right. I think probably um, Trump has, has a lot of influence on Twitter. Um, but consider Facebook's attempt to kind of review uh, whether Trump should be allowed back on the platform, right? They created a $120 million panel of, you know, over 30 of the world's leading experts on this issue only to conclude that they were gonna kick the can further down the road, right? So if we can't, you know, with $120 million and 30 of the world's leading experts on, on law and human rights can't make this call, how can we expect Facebook or, or, or so let's say Twitter, a much smaller and uh, less wealthy business to make these kind of decisions at scale? You know, it's not, not just one Trump, there's, you know, many, many people on both sides, including a lot of celebrity accounts. So. You know, again, I could, for me, it kind of comes back to this, like, we're not going to content moderate our way out of this. Now, should we, should these platforms be making these decisions carefully? Absolutely. Should they be, you know, articulating transparent policies and following them? Absolutely. And we don't always see that. That's disappointing. But the broader point I want to make is that, you know, there's no, I think, one size fits all solution here. 
And no matter how much um, platforms try to play whack-a-mole with more extreme accounts or misinformation, um, we're probably not going to get very far and we might even be counterproductive. So that's why I focus so much of our efforts to try to think about incentivizing more positive behavior, because that hasn't really been explored in this space a lot. Like, how do you design social media to make it less polarizing and to make people come together instead of push each other apart? So if we could hit reset and sort of design from scratch a new platform uh, that's drawn on conclusions you found from your research, what would that look like? How would that be designed and what kind of behavior would you expect it to incentivize? I think that's the question we should all be asking. You know, like right now we're kind of waiting for industry to save us and, and industry doesn't have a lot of incentive to change, right? The only thing that would lead an industry to make giant sweeping changes, I think, is if there was some new competition, some kind of new kind of platform. And, you know, lots of people will say, okay, well, Facebook's got 75% market share. How on earth could a new platform come along and, and dethrone them, right? But remember, we're early in the history of social media. You know, like 10 years ago, I'm old enough to remember MySpace, you know, which, um, you know, was at the, at the time uh, that it came out, you know, um, you know, had, had eclipsed Friendster and, and, uh, and other platforms and was really seeming to take off. And then, of course, along comes Facebook. And then two or three years after Facebook gains momentum, momentum, Instagram comes along and then Instagram becomes so successful that Facebook has to acquire it. Right. And on and on and on. Right. All the way up to, uh, to Clubhouse, for example. Right. So. I think there's appetite for change. I think people, most people, I, I don't think many people say, don't you just love Facebook or don't you just love using Twitter? I think most people have a highly um, ambivalent relationship with our platforms and would like a more positive experience. Now, is everyone going to want to engage in the kind of depolarizing behavior, correcting perception gaps and so on? Of course not. Um, but I think we need a place where the people like your listeners and viewers can come together and talk. Um, it won't be everyone, it won't be 75% of Americans, but it might be that 10% that's really passionate about politics and tends to influence other people. So what would a platform look like for them? I think that's the question we should be asking. And, you know, one thing we know from doing the research on the echo chamber that I just mentioned is the reason why it's simply exposing people to the other side doesn't work is the other side isn't producing more often than not, you know, highly rational, you know, persuasive civil messages, right? It's, it's partisan warfare. We're calling each other names. So you're simply turning up the volume of the name calling that you're exposed to. And what's that going to do? It's going to, you know, heighten your sense of partisan identity and then really make you engage in the same kind of name calling right back, right? We see too much of that all the time, especially because the most vocal people on social media are also the most extreme, something you mentioned in the intro here. So, yeah, so, you know, like, how do we overcome that? And I think the interesting question is, is there a way to shed the baggage associated with our partisan identities? Is there a way that we can kind of enter into a conversation without first trying to size up the other side? Like, are they for us or against us? And focus more on the content of the ideas. And, you know, in the polarization lab, we had a lot of long discussions about how would you do that? And the idea that we came up with in the end was a little bit counterintuitive. It was, what about anonymous conversation? Now you might say, and, and there's some evidence in my book of how bad anonymity can be for social media, right? It allows people to uh, hide. You know, it allows people to say things they would never say in real life. But another, I think, much less well-appreciated feature of anonymity is that it allows people to explore ideas outside the context of the identities of the people delivering them and outside the peer pressure from their own side. You know, so if you're a Democrat concerned about defunding the police, right? you're very unlikely to start, you know, going off on Twitter about what a bad idea that is, uh, because, you know, you're, you're going to fear what your own side thinks, you know, or if you want to like come out on, uh, you know, with a, with a moderate uh, perspective on, uh, um, you know, p police and uh, uh, race, race and policing, right. Um, you probably fear what the other side is going to, is going to attack you just because you're starting to talk about politics. Right. So what is the net value of anonymity? Now I'm not saying, at all, that all social media platforms should be anonymous. I think that would be a bad mistake. But I think if we give people the chance to engage in an anonymous conversation, we, we might be surprised. And here's why I think that. About two years ago, we created our own social media platform for scientific research in the polarization lab. We wanted to be able to pull the levers of the platforms themselves that might change the incentive structure. 
So, you know, instead of saying, you know, tweaking a little bit of Twitter or tweaking a little bit of Facebook, let's try to peel back the layers of social media platforms and isolate the ones that are polarizing those that aren't. And we thought that anonymity might be an interesting lever to pull. So we put Republicans and Democrats into a social media platform that we gave the somewhat lame name, Discuss It, not to, because we didn't want to only cue people who cared a lot about politics. We asked them to talk about either immigration or gun control for about an hour with a member of the other party anonymously. And what we found somewhat surprisingly is that this had a strong depolarizing effect, particularly for Republicans. Republicans depolarized in anonymous conversations at about six times the rate of Democrats. So it's a really exciting finding. You know, there aren't a lot of evidence, there isn't a lot of evidence of kind of what might work to depolarize social media. And, and this might be part of the puzzle. Now we need much more research and we're currently trying to raise money in the polarization lab right now to do many more of these kinds of studies. Um, but we think that, you know, this research and this platform that we built could help inspire some, you know, some entrepreneurs to really try to develop us evidence-based social media, you know, one that, you know, ultimately we hope people would enjoy more, you know, people don't want to engage in the kind of hateful rhetoric all the time. I think at least a lot of people don't and advertisers don't want their, you know, commercials or ads to run alongside hateful content. Right. So, you know, this could, there could even be business incentives here. I'm not going to try to, you know, overstate that, you know, again, we're not going to take down it, uh, Facebook with this type of platform. But, you know, we've seen the splintering of social media all over the place. Think of Pinterest, you know, think of LinkedIn, think of like, you know, we have different kinds of social media. Think of Strava for sports, right? We have all sorts of different niche um, social media platforms. So why not one where people uh, like the audience of the Braver Angels podcast could come together and talk anonymous? And do you have any theories as to why, at least in that experiment, the Republicans depolarized at such a greater rate than the Democrats? We've thought a lot about that. You know, in the original experiment we did, where we paid the um, Republicans to, to follow the Democrats, they actually became much more conservative um, than the Democrats became liberal. So the, the, this backfire effect seemed to be stronger for conservatives. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out why that is. And then when we did this anonymous experiment, right, the opposite happened. They depolarized more. One interpretation that I'm, I've become most attracted to is that, you know, the strength of the identity on the, on the Republican side, what it means to be a Republican is, is simply much more coherent. You know, the Democratic Party is a big tent, lots of different types of people constantly trying to draw circles around people who have different kinds of interests, different kinds of identities. Whereas the Republican Party, you know, one can argue with survey data that it's, you know, simply got, you know, five or six kind of core motivating beliefs. Yes, there's been changes since Trump. Yes, there's, you know, there, there's always kind of uh, uh, some, some variation there. But in general, that the strength of the Republican identity is stronger. And therefore, you know, the opportunity to explore ideas outside the orthodoxy, right, outside the peer pressure of other Republicans, perhaps, is perhaps even stronger um, when you're in this anonymous setting. So, so maybe it's the case that, you know, Republicans are really scared of, of each other. Now, Democrats are also scared of each other, according to our um, uh, an analysis, because we, we saw that um, um, on, the, on the Democratic side. It was just much larger for the Republicans. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. It's almost like the Republicans could be more elastic because they have greater fear of in-group enforcement. Although exactly. I've noticed on the on the left, especially with younger people, it seems to be almost just as strong, at least on my social media, you can get, you know, your head chopped off pretty quickly if you deviate from tribal orthodoxy. I wonder, since you work on campus and I imagine you work with students a lot, how do you see this sort of environment manifesting in terms of public discourse, the public square? Um, you know, what professors feel comfortable talking about in class. Have you seen uh, sort of these changes over the past few years at Duke in terms of the kind of tenor and climate of public discourse and polarization? Yeah, I think you're right that there is a strong amount of self-censorship going on in, in college campuses. Um, I see that in, for example, anonymous student evaluations of classes. I also pull my students periodically to try to see whether they feel comfortable expressing their views. And I think particularly conservative students do not always feel comfortable expressing their views. You know, and, and the thing is, and I think you, you were alluding to this, 
it's not just concerned for what the professor thinks of them. It's concerned for what the rest of their classmates think of them. And, you know, I think we're really in this moment where, you know, really kind of attitudes towards academics are, are becoming polarized, like everything else is becoming polarized right now. Um, you know, historically, if you look across parties, there's been a lot of support for science, you know, like people like science, science, derived, you know, gives us all sorts of societal benefits, Republicans and Democrats are both pretty strong boosters of science it used to be supporting scientific research had strong bipartisan appeal, you know, we're seeing a little bit of that again now with the kind of current uh, bipartisan bill to, to, to compete with China, of course. But, um, but overall, like, you know, though people like science, the attitudes towards scientists are changing, you know, attitudes towards academics are changing. And I do worry a lot uh, that uh, conservatives are starting to view uh, college campuses as a place where there's just kind of not much room for their views. Yeah, how do you get how do you get by this? I mean, this is the huge huge question. You know, I don't think there's any easy answers. Um, I think you know a lot of people want to just have town hall meetings and have the great debates and so on and so forth. I think we should do that. I think those kind of in-person encounters have a lot of value. It helps us humanize each other and so on. But I also don't think we can get Pollyannish about the potential for these kind of offline situations to solve the problem, right? Like students live online now, you know, I, I'm, I mean, they're on Instagram as, mu as much as they're in class, right? And so we have to be thinking a lot more about how social media can provide that space. And, you know, students themselves, you know, one of the interesting trends I've seen um, just anecdotally is like, the use of anonymous accounts on Instagram to convey political messages, you know, now, again, sometimes these can go very, um, very badly, you know, this, this can be, this can promote incivility, um, but that people resorting to anonymity, I think, underscores how uncomfortable people feel. So, you know, perhaps anonymity is part of the solution. Uh, couldn't be the only solution, of course, we need more technology to kind of, you know, incubate um, these kind of debates and find, find safe ways to disagree. But, but I share your concern. I think there is a strong uh, pressure on conservative students on, on uh, a lot of campuses right now. Mm. One platform that I've always been impressed by when it comes to the richness of the discourse and the depolarizing nature is Reddit. And I wonder if you've done research on Reddit because obviously Reddit has these contained communities and people can upvote or downvote. And it does seem that oftentimes um, the content with the broadest appeal to the group is the one that will surface, uh, you know, whereas on Facebook or Twitter, there's not really an upvote or downvote feature. It's basically right. just like or engage or reply. And so mm -hmm. there's perverse incentives. Um, have you looked at Reddit at all and, and what we might learn from from their community, because it's always seemed to kind of stand apart in some ways than the others. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, Reddit's, uh, the subreddit changed my view was actually part of the inspiration for our, for our research on anonymity. If you've not seen it, this is a just wonderful community where people kind of post a controversial view and say, you know, change my view and you're rewarded with deltas uh, as kind of symbol if you, if the person changes their view, says they changed their view, right? And so what's interesting mm. there is, you know, when you think about like, this, you know, if, if social media is fundamentally a quest for status, which is very much how I see, see it, um, then this is an interesting incentive, right? Instead of just trying to get more likes and follows for saying something crazy, right? You're actually trying to change someone's mind. It changes the way you're going to behave, the way you're going to act, right? I would also note that these forums, most, most Reddit users are pretty anonymous, right? So that it, it also has right. this feature. Now, obviously, there's bad parts of Reddit, too. But I think you're right that this 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 kind of like the this this the best answer rising. There's a lot of examples of this and other other uh, types of, uh, for example, software sites like Stack Overflow that are that are really useful for for computer programmers have the same kind of principle, right? Upvote this, and then everybody kind of first gets exposed to the consensus view instead of the divisive divisive view, and that's you know very much what we're trying to do with the leaderboard. The other thing that's really interesting about Reddit um, has been some other research showing the value of kind of articulating the rules of a subreddit. So it, basically simple interventions, like just when someone first comes onto a subreddit and say, you know, um, here are the rules of this subreddit. Don't do X, Y, or Z. We try to do A, B, and C. Simply showing those rules seems to create better behavior. And it speaks to a broader phenomenon, which is that this uncivil behavior is really contagious, right? Um, you know, there's been experiments where, for example, you have people read a news article 
And sometimes the first comment is a really trolly comment. Sometimes it's a very cerebral comment. And sure enough, the people who see the troll comment become trolly. And the people who see the cerebral comment become more cerebral. So there's a lot of evidence that, you know, there's these simple, you know, simple, relatively simple things that could be done to kind of set the tone for how, uh, you know, uh, a social media user should behave, right? A lot of the incentives on Facebook or Twitter are to make people laugh or make people angry, but not to change their minds. So, you know, um, that's why I think uh, I, I agree Reddit is a really nice example sometimes um, of, of what social media could be. Right. And I wonder to what extent it has to do with the fact that subreddits are sort of organized around common interests or mm -hmm. common purpose, um, because it seems like they're sort of crowdsourcing their moderation. Right. So people can sort of rise as users and have greater power to moderate other content. But it's hard to imagine how that might work on Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and well, there's, there's some interesting, so many, yeah. Yeah, there's some interesting new attempts, especially by Twitter, to try to use that kind of crowdsourcing element. So Twitter's new Birdwatch uh, initiative, uh, really interesting. Basically, what they're doing is allowing people to become sort of credentialed misinformation detectives. And once you're kind of part of this Birdwatch team, you're able to identify posts that are either false or misleading um, in conjunction with other users. And so the idea here is to kind of like see if we can crowdsource some of this, you know, mis misinformation and misleading posting. Um, and, you know, it's really interesting. Um, they've got, you know, a, a, a small but steady group of users using it. And what's most impressive, I think, is that Twitter is each day releasing all of the data pr produced by the bird watchers. So it can be studied. We can learn from it. You know, we can see whether, you know, biased decisions are somehow leaking in through, you know, for example, the partisan background of people participating. But there is some power and some other evidence, you know, research from um, MIT, for example, that suggests crowdsource, you know, information, misinformation detection could work. So I do think, you know, the power of the crowd, right? We've become so focused on the on the bad, bad behavior, right? And we forget about the good parts of the internet. There's a lot of good, you know, there's a lot of uh, information accessibility. There's a lot of power. You know, we have these examples like Wikipedia, for example, of like, you know, the power of the crowd. Um, but the crowd has to be guided, right? The, the, the crowd has to have purpose. And I think the biggest issue for me with most of today's powerful platforms is that they don't really have a point. You know, Facebook was designed to help Harvard undergraduates figure out whether other people are attractive. And then it right. went through this chaotic, totally ad hoc evolution to become, you know, the primary square for democracy in, the, in, in, in this century, right? And it's not going to do that, right? Twitter started as a forum for messaging your friends more um, more efficiently. Instagram started as a as a website for creating alcohol based gatherings, right? Why would you why would we expect any of these places to really incentivize good behavior? And I think nobody's just really stepped back and said, yeah, what's the point of Facebook? It's just this sprawling large platform that is being used by many different people in many different ways. And and yeah, maybe if we have a, a greater purpose or especially a more noble purpose, that will guide the type of people who use the platform and all ha also how they use the platform. Yeah, that's a really good point. How can we use intentionality to create a community? Because then expectations are set and oftentimes expectations govern behavior and, and govern norms much more than can be sort of, you know, self-produced in the wild, wild west where people are using the platform for all sorts of different ends and interests. That's right. Um, well, so as we move toward the end of the conversation, where do, you, where do you hope to take the polarization lab? What are you really hoping to dig into over the next few years? Yeah, well, as I said, you know, we are really at the early stages of all this. You know, we've, we've really only started to scratch the surface of what might be possible, both with our, you know, our own social media platform and trying to, you know, now I don't want to give your listeners the, the impression that they can go use this right now. It's not a, it's not a platform in the world. It's a platform for research right now. And the idea is that someone else might come along and leverage the insights from our research to create a better kind of social media. Um, so in the short term, you know, we can study things like that upvote button that you just mentioned, you know, does that create more civil behavior? Um, you know, does a different kind of algorithm for bringing people into conversation with each other change whether people are going to be more or less civil? All sorts of stuff we can do on that end. And then, you know, the other interesting thing is, well, we're waiting for a new platform to come along or maybe the current platforms to change. 
there's middleware that we can use, plug-in technology that we can use in tandem with Twitter, like our leaderboard or like the bots that I mentioned that your listeners or viewers can follow in order to expose themselves to people from the other side who people on their side seem to like, um, you know, fundamentally kind of reordering what appears in their feeds. Um, there's ways that users themselves can take control. And I'm actually pretty optimistic. There's a lot of efforts afoot, not just our lab, but all over the place to try to incubate tools that empower users. And one of the ones that I didn't talk about yet that I think I would love for people to check out is one that helps you identify perception gaps on social media. At the beginning of this uh, podcast, where we talked a lot about how important those perception gaps are and how, how we need to break the social media prism, the prism that distorts our identities. And we have apps that, for example, help you identify and avoid extremists. Uh, we look at, for example, the language that they use or other kind of demographic characteristics to help people figure out whether they are interacting with someone who is worth their time or maybe a troll who's only out to antagonize them. We also have tools to help encourage more self-reflection among social media users. So you can take a survey to see uh, kind of where you fall on, on the liberal to conservative spectrum. Then you can plug in your Twitter handle and see what your posts say about your politics and compare those two things. Is there a huge gap? You know, are you one of those missing moderates who is not really involved in the conversation? And what's the consequence of you not being involved in the con conversation? Even though you might not like uh, getting attacked, um, maybe by not participating, we're all allow all of the moderates are kind of allowing uh, the extremists to dominate the conversation. And so, you know, um, tools that help people become more reflective social media users think more about how um, their social media behavior fits into the bigger picture and creates this prism-like effect. And I'm, I don't, I'm optimistic because we know that, again, fixing those perception gaps, and this, is, this, this evidence now comes not only from the U.S., but in dozens of countries around the world, if we become more informed about what rival groups think of us and learn that they don't hate us as much as we think they do, which is almost always the case uh, across many countries, we become much, much more warm towards them and much more accepting of them. So simply figuring out that these, you know, um, that, that these perception gaps exist um, has a huge effect, let alone trying to, to correct them. So, so, you mm -hmm. know, like that's what gives me optimism and that's where I'd love to see more innovation in, the, in this space. One thing that occurs to me is that there might even be kind of like a self-perception gap. Um, you know, because we live in this political binary, because all the rhetoric is so charged, a lot of times people are maybe even afraid to investigate what they actually really think. And I was thinking about this because the New York Times recently released a tool where it was like, if America had a six party system, where would you mm -hmm. fall? Um, and then, you know, you answer 20 questions, so, you know, about immigration or defunding the police. Uh, and then it kind of, you know, spits you out where you go on the graph. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people were really interested in that because it told them something about themselves. You know, mm -hmm. you're not just a progressive or a conservative. You have a better sense of where you fall. And so mm -hmm. I think tools that help people more fully understand and express themselves will then help them grant that same sort of charity to others because mm -hmm. it sort of reveals that, you know, obviously we're not stereotypes, but when we live in this completely flat binary system, that's really all we have. And so I was just, that just occurred to me kind of like this self-perception gap. How can we help people not only uh, see others accurately, but mm -hmm. It, social media almost provides like a prism through which we see ourselves and, mm -hmm. and what are the ways that we can break that prism so that we can mm -hmm. more fully realize our own identities yeah absolutely and that's exactly the argument i make in in this new book breaking the social media prism we need to become more reflective not only of you know what other people are doing but yeah what we're doing and, and our all of our behavior the big big take-home message for me from more than a decade of research in this area is that you know it's us, it's us that's driving the problem. And, you know, we all have this, it's always the other person, right? It's always the other guy that, that's really the problem, right? But it turns out everybody thinks that. And so that kind of, you know, what we often call kind of pluralistic ignorance, we tend to misunderstand what other people are doing or saying or thinking, right? That's the problem. Uh, so, you know, the more that we can all, yeah, accept a little bit of the blame or, you know, maybe at least think about how, 
you know, well, maybe I shouldn't have liked that really sarcastic comment about, you know, Donald Trump or maybe, you know, because it really wasn't that funny. It was just ad hominem, you know, or, you know, um, maybe that meme about Elizabeth Warren was just cruel and there's no reason to share that, you know, um, you know, or maybe, you know, when I don't get a lot of likes for my moderate posts, it might not be because people don't like it. It might just be because the preponderance of extremists on our platforms don't like it, right? So, so accepting a little bit of, um, you know, being a little braver to, to, to um, voice our views, I think is, is really important and accepting that it's not always gonna be um, a pleasant process, right? Um, none of the hard work of depolarization is gonna be entirely pleasant, but it doesn't have to be terrible either, you know? And I think just identifying the areas, we have other tools on polarizationlab.com that track hashtags that seem to be trending positively among both Republicans and Democrats, instead of those that we tend to see you know, like dump Trump or something like that, that just are po inherently polarized, you know, we can, we can get together. Sometimes it's something as, you know, banal as sports or, or entertainment, you know, this is, this is bringing people together. So let's lean into it. Totally. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the word bravery, because obviously that's, that's key to our approach that we want people to be, feel like they can speak freely and fully. They don't need to paper over their differences or, moderate their views uh, so long as they're operating in, in good faith. And I think we're sp specifically looking at how our work could help people engage on social media, not just in person. So we're going to be putting out a new social media uh, e-course so people can sort of go through the course and better understand how they perform on social media and kind of gain tools so that the next time they're thinking about whether to hit like or post that incendiary comment, they will have uh, sort of a basis of understanding for the consequences of that and how they wanna be in the world and how they are in the world. Because once you can sort of understand those two things, it becomes easier to close the gap. And I think we're gonna hopefully follow that up with a social media workshop where people could actually take an online workshop that's moderated and maybe even do a little bit of role play. And while of course there's always self-selection bias, which everything we do, it's always the people who are at least a little curious or at least want to put themselves out there. It's our hope that they can then become leaders and sort of build this community over time. Because as you mentioned, I think the appetite is out there, right? I mean, we don't have to convince people that polarization is a problem or that social media is toxic and unpleasant. And sure, you're always gonna have a small uh, minority of the population that is just in it for cynical reasons, but there is sort of that exhausted majority. And I think the work that you're doing, the work we're doing, we're hopefully kind of lighting a path forward that we can get critical mass and over time actually start to influence institutions as well as individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Music to my ears. Cool. Well, Chris, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, thank you for coming on the podcast. I would encourage our listeners to check out the Polarization Lab online and also, of course, to get the book, Breaking the Social Media Prism. Uh, people can find it, I presume, online, on Amazon. Is that right? That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again. And please come back on the podcast soon. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me.